Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. It is so good to see you all today, and for those that are guests on campus, you are welcome anytime. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Jim Daly, President and CEO of Focus on the Family in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Jim Daly is a husband, father, author, and broadcaster. He's the president of Focus on the Family and host of its daily radio broadcast, which is heard by more than 6 million listeners a week on nearly 2,000 radio stations across the United States. The show has been honored as Program of the Year by the NRB. Daly is also the host of a new podcast called Refocus with Jim Daly, in which he interviews respected thinkers and influencers of our day. In each episode, listeners will be challenged, inspired, and equipped to engage the culture by sharing God's truth with others in a loving and a graceful way. Under his leadership, the ministry has reinvigorated its traditional focus on helping couples build strong marriages and raise healthy, resilient kids. Daly and his wife, Jean, have two sons. They live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and it is an honor to have him on campus today. And so, Jim, will you please come, and would you all welcome me in welcoming Dr. Daly today? Appreciate it. Thank you, Appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm nervous. This is like a seminary. I don't think I've ever spoken at a seminary. I'm an MBA guy. So you guys correct all my theology that I'll riff off today. And you, uh, What a day. Today's Ash Wednesday. You're celebrating your 100th year, right? 1924. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Mark. It's, it's, a, it's a great day. But most importantly, it's Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> so when I told Jean, I said, hey, I've got this speaking opportunity. She's like, can you be back in time for dinner? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the right answer for husbands, right? So she was good with it as long as I get back for dinner. But it's so good to be with you guys. I want to confess a couple of things right from the get-go. Uh, you know, I think in Christian leadership, Mark, this is so true, we try to project perfection. It's such a joke. <laughs> we are just like everybody else. We have our difficulties. We have our struggles. I'm going to give you two examples, one from my own marriage and then a second one from my parenting problems. Anybody have parenting problems? Uh, so my marriage problem, this is funny on Va Valentine's Day, because a year ago, I was so busy. Give me a violin, please. I mean, I, I think I taped three broadcasts in the morning, had meetings throughout the day. Oh, no, I forgot a Valentine's card. So I called my son, Trent. I said, Trent, you're coming up to say hi to mom and I. Can you, could you pick out a card for me? <laughs> now, he's really good. I didn't know he was this good. But he's texting me in the afternoon. I got six cards picked out. Which one would you like? I never had a chance to respond. So I get home and he goes, I just picked one since you didn't respond to me. And so I sign it. Don't even read it. I know this is horrible. <laughs> so we're sitting at dinner together. We're just doing dinner as a family. Then Gene and I are going to have some dessert away from the kids. And, uh, and uh, so Gene's reading the card. She's going, man, this is the best card you've ever gotten me. <laughs> So now I'm in a dilemma, because Trent knows he's sitting at the table. He knows I didn't get the card. Do I take credit for it, or do I confess? And so I said, hon, you got to know Trent <laughs> picked it out. And she turned to him and said, you've got such a great heart, Trent. Thank you. <laughs> that is like super embarrassing to share with you guys. So that was a year ago. So on the parenting one, to confess my inadequacy, so this one, this is an actual voicemail that we got. Now this, I got to set this up. Show the picture if you could. To this is uh, er, this is years ago. So my kids, my two boys now, Trent and Troy, are 23 and 21. So this goes back. They're probably seven and five. So you see Dennis the Menace in that picture, <laughs> the one in front. That's Troy, and Trent and Troy. We left them for the first time with a 15-year-old babysitter. And Gene and I went off to the Broadmoor Hotel to engage in a Jewish Christian dialogue dinner with Dr. Dobson and Shirley. That night, Shirley set the napkin on fire. She put it accidentally over the candle <laughs> at the Broadmoor and whoosh, this fire. I'm going, trying to take care of everything. You know, that's my background, putting the fire out at the table. Then Gene's phone is ringing. Bling, bling. And the night before, the boys and I had done this uh, science experiment you could buy at Hobby Lobby for $14.99, if you want to know. And it's this, it's this 
test tube thing. You connect to a battery and you submerge it in water and overnight the water gets, gets displaced and it replaces it with hydrogen gas. Any scientists in here? So hydrogen gas is rocket fuel and you hold that test tube upside down, you go, Poof! you light it and it goes, Poof! and kids love that. But I left it out on the counter and didn't put it high and away. And so, again, first 15-year-old babysitter we ever had, that was the only time she babysat for us. <laughs> because as we're sitting at this dinner at the Broadmoor, this was the voicemail that was left for us by Troy the Younger about his older brother. Hi, Mommy. Clinton actually was dumb enough to um, get the battery I put my tongue on in a mini junk cable and actually plug it in the DVD player and it caught smoke. But don't worry, it did not start a fire. This is Troy, and, my, and by the way, Trent did it, okay? There's okay. more. Have, have I been specific, specific enough? Okay, bye. There's more. Oh, besides, don't go easy on it. Can you imagine having this kid as your younger brother? So I think we could put up the older photo. This is a more recent photo. For God. There they are today. There's Big Trent, 6'7", and Troy, the, uh, the prankster on the left. So, and there's Gene. So thank you. That's the family. It is Focus on the Family. So that's all, <laughs> all I have to share about that. Um, C.S. Lewis said this, crying is all right for a while, but sooner or later, you've got to stop and decide what to do. So as part of chapel, let me introduce you to the uh, difficulty I've been having lately. This is going to be really personal, but I want to share it because this is what life's about. So for me, you know, I will say I was an orphan kid. It was tough. It was terrible. It was a deep valley. My mom and dad divorced when I was five. I'm the fifth child. I'm six years away from my closest sibling, the oops baby. Anybody one of those? You get introduced that way? Did, was there a hand that came up over here? Yeah, awesome. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're with your parents and they'll say, oh, this is our accident. It's really, it builds your self-esteem. You know, like you're not supposed to be here, you know? We were too old when we had you. So like, you're not worthy of anything. But that was part of it. So I'm this little kid with lots of older siblings. And uh, sure enough, uh, when I was five, my dad could not beat alcoholism. My mom was tired of it. She divorced him and we moved off and onto our own. And that lasted for about three years. And then she remarried this guy, Hank from a military background. He's a military drill sergeant. Anybody have that guy for a stepdad? Yes, you did too. All right, I like this side of the room. <laughs> anyway, Hank would do a white glove test every Saturday morning. My sisters particularly hated it. I don't know why. Uh, but I, you know, one day I didn't hang up my jacket and he made me hang it up 500 times. Somebody said to me, you mean 50? I said, no, 500. And he made me count it out like a military guy, right? So I was hanging up my jacket, and I was so stupid. He wasn't in the bedroom watching me. I could have laid on the bed and gone, one! But he was listening to me from the kitchen. He was a gourmet chef. That's what he did professionally. And he said, just shout the number out when you hang it up. Yes, sir! And uh, anyway, I did it 500 times. You walk into our closet today, my side of the closet, that's Hank. It's like shirt to the right, shirt to the right, suit by color, suit by color. I mean, it's like organized. Jean side, oh my gosh. I told her one time, if you give me 10 minutes, I could take care of this. She said, stay away from it. <laughs> but I mean, it, this is just part of the DNA, right? And I think Jesus at the Center was such a great song to sing because this is the most critical part of the whole story. And our, you know, our testimonies, it says that they overcame through the power of the blood and the power of the testimony, right? So this, I share this story only to lift Jesus up because that is what's most important. I, I may, some people come up to me and say, well, you got the short stick. Well, praise God. We don't all get the long sticks. Some of us get short sticks, but let's be joyful about it and manage it in the right way. So I'll unfold the story and then I'm gonna bring the scripture into it. But you know, we keep going and I'm just be bopping along. I'm just a happy kid. I'm pretty joyful. And then all of a sudden, my brother comes home from the Navy. He's 10 years older than me, Mike. There's 
four other siblings. And so Mike brings us into this room one at a time, a bedroom, and by age order. So my brother Dave goes in there, comes out crying. My sister Kim goes in there, comes out crying. My sister D, I know we're all three, three letter names, I don't know. D walks into the room, comes out crying. And then I go into the room and I'm thinking, I don't want to go in here. You know, Mike's going, Jimmy, we need to tell you something. Come in here. Okay. What I didn't realize, my mom had been really sick, and uh, Hank was so guarded of her as, you know, just stepdad, he would lock her door, wouldn't let us see her. I probably went three months without seeing my mom before she died. And so Mike was calling me into the room, and he, he sat me on his knee, and he said to me, I don't know how to say this to you, Jim, but mom's dead. I was like, what? I mean, I couldn't comprehend it. I'm nine years old, just kind of living my life, bebopping along. And here's the amazing news, and this is the God at the center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all. My mom was a super, super woman. I mean, she was just a wonderful mom. I only had her nine years. She was a waitress. She worked two, three jobs, take care of five kids. Think of that. Not on any government help or anything. And she was so awesome as a waitress. I remember she called me up one time and said, hey, um, one of the Three Stooges is here, and this Larry from the Three Stooges would come into her restaurant. So she said, "Would you?" I've asked him, "Do you want to come have lunch with Larry, the Three Stooges?" Okay, it's like ten o'clock, so I'm running down there to have lunch with Larry the Stooge. And so you know, she sits me down. He's eating corn. He's eating uh, chicken noodle soup and half a sandwich. And what do you want? I'll have what he has. You know, I'm like in awe. Now, remember, Larry's the one with the hair around the side, nothing on top, just the side. And I'm sitting there going, hi, Mr. Stooge. And he had this, like, New Jersey accent, you know. Hey, kid, how you doing? Doing good. And I'm waiting for him to whoop, 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 something, you know. <laughs> nothing. He was like a normal guy. So you doing good in school? I think so. I mean, it was just like this normal conversation, which was very disappointing. And uh, we got through lunch, but that was my mom. She just was connected with people. She had lots of people come to her, her funeral. But the amazing thing, the God part of this story is that my mom came to Christ the day before she died. And the person, who, the two people that led her to the Lord were our neighbors, the Hopes. H-O-P-E. We called them Grandma and Grandpa Hope. He was a bus driver, and she was a, a mom and grandma. And so that's how we knew this family. And they went down to my mom's bedside at Long Beach Memorial and said, Jan, you need to know Jesus. Do you want to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And she said, yes. And isn't that amazing? It could be that easy. Amen. Just nobody had ever asked her. She grew up Catholic. We used to eat a lot of fish on Friday. Anybody in that kind of spot? The siblings and I would always say, why do we eat fish sticks on Friday? <laughs> it was my mom's Catholic background. Like we always had fish on Friday. Anyway, so mom died. We go to the funeral. A couple things happened in the funeral. One was everybody said to me, you need to put the flower in the casket and lean over and kiss your mom. Has anybody been in a funeral with a parent like that? So the first thing, I'm the last kid to go out because of age. We went in age order. You guys get a theme on this? So I see my brothers and sisters lay the flower in the casket and lean in and kiss my mom. So I go out there, and the other thing they said to me is, don't cry. Now, why would you tell a kid that? At his mother's funeral, I have no idea. But I'm just thinking, okay, don't cry. Put the flower in, kiss my mom goodbye. Don't cry. So I put the flower in. I touch her hand, and it's stone cold. And I just pulled back. I couldn't do that. And I remember turning to face people as I was leaving the room. There were probably like 500 people at her funeral. And I just was, don't cry, don't cry, to get out the door. And we left the funeral, got back to the house after the graveside ceremony. And Hank had sold all our furniture, our stepdad. And we walk into this house and we just have a few boxes in the living room, like my box of a few clothes and toys. And Hank comes out of the back bedroom and says, I can't take the pressure. I'm leaving. And Mike hugged me and said, I got to go back to my ship. We're off to Vietnam tonight. I'm like, my world's going. And then Dave said, I know somebody we could live with. They'll be our foster family. 
and I've already called them and set it up. So we moved from Long Beach, California to Morongo Valley out in the desert, and we move into this family. Their name is the real family. <laughs> you thinking I'm making these names up. <laughs> Jesus at the center of it all. So the hopes lead my mom to the Lord. Like a week later, I'm off to the real family. And it's four kids, four boys in the Reels family. The 18-year-old Dave, Paul was 17, a friend of my brother's, Gary 13, and Marky 8. And we move in, and they're on disability. They need, I think in part, they need the dollars to make their ends meet. So Denise and I, my sister Dee, we move in with them, my brother Dave. And so this was a weird year. I mean, we're living with them. Marky would steal things from me. I go to the mom and dad and say, Mr. and Mrs. Real, you know, Marky has stolen my four headless G.I. Joes. I kind of know my inventory. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, you know, Jimmy, Marky would never do that. You're just not fitting in with our family. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, it's a good thing, right? Have you seen your family? I mean, Marky was a pathological liar. Gary was in the front end of the gay movement, ended up dying of AIDS in San Francisco in 1982. And then uh, Paul uh, had, I think, two or three girls pregnant in high school. I mean, it, not that it was, things happen. I get that. You know, we're, nobody's a perfect person. Don't misread me. But I was like, <laughs> I'm not fitting into your family? So that went on for like a year. I'm living with this family. And Mr. Real and uh, Mrs. Real, the social worker comes out. I'm like 10 years old now. And I'm sitting with the social worker. And she looks at me and says, we have a problem. I said, finally, an adult that gets it. And she said, Mr. Real told me you tried to kill him. Are you with me? I'm 10 going, how? <laughs> now, there's two of you in the room going, did you? No. I mean, I was like a wallflower. I was going to school, come home, don't bother me. I'd go play for a couple hours, come back, eat dinner, and go to bed. That was my routine, just to stay out of the way. I was not wanting to be noticed and to have him say that. So I'm sitting at the table, and she said, I don't know how to explain it. And I said, well, how did he say I tried to kill him? Can you fill in the blanks? And she said, well, he said you tried to push him off a cliff. And I was like, but we live in Morongo Valley. I mean, I'm 10. I'm figuring this out. So anyway, so then my dad shows up. Like six months later, my dad comes out out of nowhere. Hadn't seen him for six years, five years. And I'm like on his leg all day, just like, take me with you. But it was my alcoholic father. So he had been trying to track us down for a year since my mom had died. He had heard my mom had died. So anyway... So I decide, yeah, I want to go live with him. He offered, my D sister D and I moved with my brother, or my, my dad, for one year. My sister turned 18, I'm turning 11, 11 and a half, somewhere in there. And the siblings don't think I should live with my father anymore. And so I need to tell them I'm going to live with somebody else. I'll tell you that part of the story. So I tell my, I tell my dad at this family con uh, convention with the spouses of my older siblings all there. And I looked at my dad and said, I don't think I should live with you anymore. And he said, why? And I said, well, because of how you treated mom. Imagine an 11-year-old saying that to you. To his credit, he got up, came over, hugged me, and said, I wasn't a good father. I'm not a good husband. And he, that was the last time I talked to him. Four months later, he was dead. Those are the last words I shared with my dad. To my regret. And so I moved in with my brother Dave. Now, he was 18, 19, married to his 16-year-old pregnant girlfriend. So I move in with him, and I said to her, what, you know, I'm like approaching 12. So what, what do I call you? She said, well, you can call me mom. <laughs> I was like, another year, I might call you for a date. Okay, mom. And she was really a nice person. Their marriage lasted only a couple of years. But I went junior high, high school, living with my brother Dave in three, three marriages in that period of time. So it was interesting. But in this, and I, this is the key. I mean, in this, this is where the Lord showed up. So I had a football coach, Paul Morrow, who got into my face about what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a quarterback of the football team, what it meant to give your life to Christ. I think this is a public school. 
Christ at the center. And he, he scholarshiped me to go to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes Camp. And so I went and gave my life to the Lord. This guy got up there, some quarterback in the NFL. I can't remember who it was. I was only 15. And he said, Has, have men let you down? Has your father let you down? Has your stepfather let you down? I thought he was going to say, has Mr. Real let you down? <laughs> I was like, wow. How'd this guy get my dossier? He said, if you want a relationship with someone who will never let you down, then I'll introduce you to Jesus. And I was like, yeah. And I accepted Christ. Now I wobbled like, you know, crazy. My brother, I'd play football Friday night and I'd say, what time do you want me home? Looking, hoping he would give me some kind of boundary. And he'd say, two, three o'clock should be fine. I was a junior in high school. Okay, I'll try to stay out that late. I mean, that was it. I mean, I, seriously, that was what I was coming from. Nothing, no boundary. I was my own mom and dad. And that's tough. That is really tough. And here's the point, and here's the connection. So the personal side of this. So I have been in a rut saying to people who care about me and love me, who are sometimes worried I'm not connected emotionally. Any guy in the room ever get that? Praise God, I'm not the only one. But I've always chalked it up to, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and go. What are you going to do? That doesn't work well in marriage. So I would say this when Jean was having a bad day, and she would say to me, Jim, not everybody's wired like you. I'm not like that. I can't do that. i got to grieve for a little while. Then hopefully I can get up and keep moving. That scared me. It literally scared me. I didn't know what to do. Probably a coping mechanism. Let's just get up and go. But this Sunday, I'm at church, Brady Boyd at New Life up in Colorado Springs, and he's preaching on the paralytic man, the man at the pool, right? Now, you're the theologian, so I'm going to hack it up here. I'm not going to look at the scripture. I'm just going to give you the paraphrase. I know everybody's going, ah, no. <laughs> but this dude is at the well for 38 years. 38 years. And it said the area, you know, there are a number of lame and crippled people there, but Jesus' attention went right to this guy. 38 years. And he says, do you want to be healed? Well, you know, every time I go to get in the pool, people get in my way and the pool's swirling, but I can't get in there. And I'm thinking, wow. And then he says, get up, pick up, and go. Basically, get up pick up your mat and walk, right? It was illuminating for me. And Gene and I have had some good discussions about this because I think in part, both are true. You need to understand when people are grieving, it's hard to get up. It's hard to pick up and it's hard to go. You need that season of mourning to be able to say, it hurts, Lord, it hurts. And it's important to be able to say to the Lord, it hurts. And believe me, God has ears for that. I think particularly where it says he's close to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. Boy, we as the church should be flocking to those things that crush us. That doesn't sound like the right doctrine, does it? Humble us, Lord. Break us, Lord, so that we know we need you. Then, when you get through that season, it is that moment. Get up. Pick up that mat, which is Brady, my pastor said, is the testimony. Get up, pick up your testimony, and walk and go. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And I don't want to be that paralytic. He says, well, Lord, you know, I, I'd like to, but, you know, I'm an orphan kid, and I got a lot of problems. And, uh, I had a good friend of mine, and I was talking to him about this. And he goes, you know what? Hasn't Jesus taken care of that orphan kid thing? This is a good friend. Smack me right in the face. He said, I think your wife needs more than that now. And God's equipped you to be more than that. So I don't know how to apply that to your life. But get up, pick up, and walk. Amen? Amen. Man, I think that is so good. Let me end with something that caught my attention. Dr. Jamie Ayton down here. He's a psychologist, Ph.D., I know that seminaries and psychologists can have conflict, but he's a believer, and he specializes in catastrophic life event. So school shooting, hurricane survival, 
some catastrophic event. And he looked at like a thousand people, talked with a thousand people that had made it through catastrophic, catastrophic event. And he said, what do you think the one characteristic is that helps a human being get through that? Of course, me, I'm like, resiliency. <laughs> Ding! See the teeth sparkle. I'm so proud of my resiliency. Nope. Anybody else? And he came to it and he said, what we found in catastrophic event, the element that helps a human being get through it is humility. Humility. Because you realize in your heart there are people worse off than you, no matter how bad your situation is. It gives you a connection of empathy. Isn't that powerful? So when Jesus says, when the Lord says, be humble for I am humble, maybe it's more than just a nice poetic gesture of character. It's actually an element of scientific fact that if you're humble like God is humble, you can get through any valley in this world, anything the enemy might crush you with because the character of God, humility is in you and it gives you the power to go through that valley. Isn't that awesome? It's not in your own strength. It's not your ability, your resiliency. It's in God's character of humility. I think that is profound. And uh, I'm grateful for the Lord and all that he's done. You know, that uh, transition of focus. So, you know, think of me. Who am I? <laughs> and so it's Dr. Dobson. And the interim president came in, Don Hodell, who worked for Reagan as Secretary of Interior, Secretary of, uh, of Energy. So it was Don Hodel. And I'm walking down the hall with Don, and Don turns to me and says, you know, Dr. Dobson and I and the board, we think you're the guy to bring it forward. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? We want you to be the next president of Focus. I'm like, you got to be kidding. Now, here's the funny part. Gene and I were praying for one year for the poor guy coming behind Dr. Dobson. <laughs> Who's praying for who's coming behind Dr. Mark, right? I mean, for a year, we're praying that. Does the Lord have a sense of humor? And I just remember thinking the night before, I couldn't sleep. I'm going, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I'm not equipped. I'm not perfect like him. And the Lord just said, it's all mine. I own what's good and healthy, and I own what's broken. Just give yourself to me. Isn't that awesome? That was during the night as I struggled about it. So the next day, we have this conference with the media, you know, the, the presser, Dr. Dobson standing next to me, and this guy from the AP goes, so how are you gonna fill his shoes? These guys are always snarky, you know? It was, you could have phrased that. It's just, how are you gonna fill his shoes? Yeah, whatever. And I just remember, I was thinking about that for a flash, and I went, hey, that's easy. I'm just gonna get my own pair of shoes. <laughs> Amen? And I think that for us in leadership, that's what it's about. We've got to be who we are. We've got to be authentic. We've got to rise to the calling that God's given us, not because of what we've learned or how we're equipped, although a great degree from DTS is outstanding. <laughs> and it will take you places. But the call is to use it wisely, humbly for the Lord. Let me pray. Father, we're grateful for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for each and every life that's represented in this room and the way that you have, yeah, Lord, the way you've pressed in on us to break us of those things that we need to be broken from. Help us, Lord, continue to restore our hearts, our hope, our faith in you, our love for you. Keep that burning every day until our last breath. Help us not to be, uh, nah, for the thief not to steal our joy in you. Lord, help us to be that broken person. Help us to keep your character at the forefront, the fruit of the Spirit, so that we're not rooted in the fruit of the other guy. May it be so. Thank you for the leadership of this great institution. Thank you for Dr. Mark and all that he's doing to provide the way forward, leaning into you, wanting to keep you at the center of all things here, Lord. In this day and age, that becomes more difficult, but he is courageous. And thank you for the faculty that support that and deliver to all these students the great news of your coming, your death and resurrection, 
And that, Lord, is the end of the story and all the truth that we need wrapped up in you. Help us to live our lives well in Christ's name. Amen.